Hello, human geographers. We are back at it again this evening. Tonight, we examine the different types of regions that exist in our world. A region is an area distinguished by a unique combination of trends or features. In much the same way that a writer divides a book into chapters and then names or classifies them, geographers divide areas into regions that differentiate them from other areas. But just like chapters in a book, the labeling of regions is a human construct. So there may not be complete agreement on what the region is and what unique combination of features distinguishes it. It could be one specific thing that unifies a region, or it could be a pattern of activity. And because regions are human constructs, the boundaries of regions are dynamic and can shift. They may overlap or be contested, and oftentimes the boundaries can be fuzzy. But regions are a good comparison tool and can vary in size from the local to the global. Let's take a look at two examples that you should know for this class. College Board has established a set of regions for human geography. These are terms that you can expect to see on the AP exam. So you should know what areas are included when we use these phrases. In fact, in your map packet, you'll need to label a blank version of both of these maps. So let's take a look at each of them briefly. Begin with the big picture view. Let's write down some observations in our notes. What do you see? What do you notice? What catches your attention? I notice that Central America is part of the North American continent, but it's its own region on here. That's because it's culturally quite distinct from other parts of North America, like the United States and Canada. Same kind of choice for Sub-Saharan Africa, which is distinguished from the rest of Africa. And the Russian Federation spans both the European and Asian continents. Now let's take a closer look at the world regions in human geography. Again, let's start with some observations that you have. Write those down. What do you see? What do you notice? What catches your attention? I'd like you to bring those observations to class because I'd like to discuss them. But for the remainder of our time tonight, we will be examining three specific categories of regions. Those are formal, functional, and vernacular. Here we go. A formal region is a type of region marked by a certain degree of homogeneity in one or more phenomena, also called a uniform region or homogeneous region. Formal regions share at least one trait, whether that's physical or human, there's something in common within the boundaries of that region. The political boundaries established between countries, as well as internal divisions within countries, are considered formal regions. Boundaries are established, and there's uniformity within that boundary. For example, with national identities or citizenship. A physical formal region could be a region that shares a particular climate, like the Mediterranean climate that you see here, with hot, dry summers and cool, wet winters. A formal cultural region could be where there's uniformity of language or religion. This map looks at the Francophone world, or the region where the dominant language is French. But this map helps us to understand a common misconception about formal regions. Just because there is a degree of uniformity doesn't mean that it needs to be 100% homogenous. Look at our French-speaking map. Does everyone within those areas speak French? No. 
but there's a high degree of homogeneity, which defines it as part of the formal region. A functional region is an area organized around a node or focal point defined by the particular set of activities or interactions that occur within it, also known as a nodal region. Again, notice that it also goes by nodal region. A node is a central point where the functions are coordinated and directed. Since it's organized around a focal point or node, the most ideal shape for a functional region would be what? A circle. But how often do you think that happens in real life? Not so often. That unifying characteristic could be a pattern of activity. For example, there's a certain level of activity surrounding a grocery store. People typically drive to their closest grocery store. The level of activity is very strong in the area immediately surrounding the store. As you get further away from one store and closer to another, the level of activity is less consistent and the boundary of that functional region is approaching. If you noticed, what I just described exhibited the spatial concept of distance decay. As distance from the node increases, interaction in the form of customer attendance right now, decreased. That is especially prevalent with functional regions. So an example of a node, a center point, around which activity operates is a city. A city has a surrounding region within which workers commute either to the downtown area or to the office parks in the suburbs. That entire urban area defined by people moving toward and within it can be a functional region. So what we see here is called the Denver Metropolitan Statistical Area or MSA. This is the city of Denver and the surrounding counties that are functionally tied to it. Meaning that people will live out in the suburbs in a different county but may work in downtown Denver. That's the node. Denver is the node and everything that functions as part of it is within its functional region. Another example would be an airline with a hub. The hub is the node and the functional region is all of the destinations they fly to from that hub. For example, the primary hub for Delta Airlines is Atlanta. Here's where things get tricky. Sometimes you'll see a country like Iraq as a formal region, with the uniformity being that the people who live within the country are citizens of the country of Iraq. But couldn't Iraq also be a functional region? The node would be the capital city, Baghdad, with the function being the political decisions that are made in Baghdad are only applicable within the boundaries of the country. You could further argue that Iraq is a functional region from a political sense, but contains three different formal regions representing differences in language, religion, and ethnic identity. So what you have to do is be able to think like a geographer. What are they asking? Is it about patterns of activity or is it about the uniformity of a characteristic? If you can think like a geographer, you'll be all right. A vernacular region is an area that people believe exists as part of their cultural identity and not as a physically demarcated entity, also known as a perceptual region. And honestly, it goes by perceptual region probably more often than it's referred to as a vernacular region. So be especially prepared for that. Perceptual regions are derived from the shared feelings and attitudes of the people who live in that area. Probably the best and most common example of a perceptual region is the American South. Picture a map in your mind of what the South is. Do you have it? Do you think we all 
had the same picture in our mind? Probably not. But we knew what I was talking about when I said the South. The key with perceptual regions is that they are perceived to exist by its inhabitants through widespread acceptance, which means that sharp borders don't typically exist with vernacular regions. In fact, it's in the definition when it says not as a physically demarcated entity. And when borders are less sharp, you may notice that as you move further away from the core of that region, the characteristic that helped to define that region begins to weaken until it disappears. It's another example of distance decay at work. But there are some regions where the cultural identity has led to groups of people identifying with one region more than another. Let's look at Quebec. A strong cultural identity toward the French language in Quebec has led certain Canadian citizens to identify more with their subnational identities, identifying as Quebecois more than Canadian. In fact, this strong attachment to this region led to an independence referendum in an attempt to break away from Canada. But if we change the scale, we see that not everyone in Quebec supported that movement. The southern parts of Quebec, where the cities of Quebec and Montreal are located, have a far higher percentage of people who speak French, and thus would have been more likely to support independence. The northern parts may not have felt the same compulsion for independence that the south felt. Ultimately, the independence referendum was unsuccessful, but in an attempt to maintain a united Canada, the Canadian government recognizes two official languages of the government, English and French. And we're going to look at several more examples of different regions tomorrow when we come to class. Have a good night, everyone.